Hello everyone, I'm Matthew Allen and welcome back to What a Book. Today we continue on in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, Chapter 11, The Dueling Club. Harry woke up on Sunday morning to find the dormitory blazing with winter sunlight and his arm reboned but very stiff. He sat up quickly and looked over at Colin's bed, but it had been blocked from view by the high curtains Harry had changed behind yesterday. Seeing that he was awake, Madame Pomfrey came bustling over with the breakfast tray and then began bending and stretching his arm and fingers. Oh, all in order, she said, as he clumsily fed himself porridge left-handed. When you've finished eating, you may leave. Harry dressed as quickly as he could and hurried off to Gryffindor Tower, desperate to tell Ron and Hermione about Colin and Dobby, but they weren't there. Harry left to look for them, wondering where they could have got to and feeling slightly hurt that they weren't interested in whether he had his bones back or not. As Harry passed the library, Percy Weasley strolled out of it, looking in far better spirits than last time they'd met. "'Oh, hello, Harry,' he said. "'Excellent flying yesterday, really excellent. Uh, Gryffindor has just taken the lead for the house cup. You earned fifty points.' "'You haven't seen Ron or Hermione, have you?' said Harry. "'No, I haven't,' said Percy, his smile fading. "'I hope Ron's not in another girl's toilet.' Harry forced a laugh, watched Percy walk out of sight, and then headed straight for Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. He couldn't see why Ron and Hermione would be in there again, but after making sure that neither Filch nor any prefix were around, he opened the door and heard their voices coming from a locked stall. "'It's me,' he said, closing the door behind him. There was a dunk, a splash, and a gasp from within the stall, and he saw Hermione's eye peering through the keyhole. "'Harry,' she said, "'you gave us such a fright. Uh, come in. How's your arm?' "'Fine,' said Harry, squeezing into the stall. An old cauldron was perched on the toilet, and a crackling from under the rim told Harry they had lit a fire beneath it. Conjuring up portable, waterproof fires was a specialty of Hermione's. "'We've come to meet you, but we decided to get started on the polyjuice potion.' Ron explained as Harry, with difficulty, looked, locked the stall again. We've decided this is the safest place to hide it. Harry started to tell them about Colin, but Hermione interrupted. We already know. We heard Professor McGonagall telling Professor Flitwick this morning. That's why we decided we'd better get going. The sooner we get a confession out of Malfoy, the better, snarled Ron. Do you know what I think? He was in such a foul temper after the Quidditch match, he took it out on Colin. There's something else said Harry, watching Hermione tearing bundles of knot grass and throwing them into the potion. Dobby came to visit me in the middle of the night. Ron and Hermione looked up, amazed. Harry told them everything Dobby had told him, or hadn't told him. Hermione and Ron listened with their mouths open. The Chamber of Secrets has been opened before? Hermione said. Oh, this settles it, said Ron in a triumphant voice. Lucius Malfoy must have opened the chamber when he was at school here, and now he's told dear old Draco how to do it. It's obvious. Wish Dobby told you what kind of monster's in there, though. I want to know how come nobody's noticed it sneaking around the school. Maybe it can make itself invisible, said Hermione, prodding leeches to the bottom of the cauldron. Or maybe it can disguise itself, pretend to be a suit of armor or something. I've read about chameleon ghouls. Oh, you've read too much, Hermione, said Ron, pouring dead lacewings on top of the leeches. He crumpled up the empty lacewing bag and looked at Harry. So Dobby stopped us from getting on the train and broke your arm? He shook his head. You know what, Harry? If he doesn't stop trying to save your life, he's going to kill you. The news that Colin Creevy had been attacked and was now lying as though dead in the hospital wing had spread through the entire school by Monday morning. The air was suddenly thick with rumor and suspicion. The first years were now moving around the castle in tight-knit groups, as though scared they would be attacked if they ventured forth alone. Ginny Weasley, who sat next to Colin Creevy in charms, was distraught, but Harry felt that Fred and George were going the wrong way about cheering her up. They were taking turns covering themselves with fur or boils and jumping out at her from behind statues. They only stopped when Percy, apocalyptic with rage, told them he was going to write to Mrs. Weasley and tell her Ginny was having nightmares. Meanwhile, hidden from the teachers, a roaring trade in talismans, amulets, and other protective devices was sweeping the school. Neville Longbottom bought a large, evil-smelling green onion, a pointed purple crystal, and a rotting newt tail before the other Gryffindor boys pointed out that he was in no danger. He was a pure blood, and therefore unlikely to be attacked. They went for Filch first, Neville said, his round face fearful, and everyone knows I'm almost a squib. In the second week of December, Professor McGonagall came around as usual, collecting names of those who would be staying at school for Christmas. Harry, Ron, and Hermione signed her list. They had heard that Malfoy was staying, which struck them as very suspicious. The holidays would be the perfect time to use the polyjuice potion and try to worm a confession out of him. Unfortunately, the potion was only half finished. They still needed the bicorn horn and the boomsling skin, and the only place they were going to get them was from Snape's private stores. Harry privately felt he'd rather face Slytherin's legendary monster than let Snape catch him robbing his office. 
What we need, said Hermione briskly as Thursday afternoon's double potions lessons loomed nearer, is a diversion. Then one of us can sneak into Snape's office and take what we need. Harry and Ron looked at her nervously. I think I'd better do the actual stealing, Hermione continued in a matter-of-fact tone. You two will be expelled if you get in any more trouble, and I've got a clean record, so all you need to do is cause enough mayhem to keep Snape busy for five minutes or so. Harry smiled feebly. Deliberately causing mayhem in Snape's potion glass was about as safe as poking a sleeping dragon in the eye. Potions lessons took place in one of the large dungeons. Thursday afternoon's lesson proceeded in the usual way. Twenty cauldrons stood steaming between the wooden desk on which stood brass scales and jars of ingredients. Snape prowled through the fumes, making waspish remarks about the Gryffindor's work while the Slytherin sniggered appreciatively. Draco Malfoy, who was Snape's favorite student, kept flicking pufferfish eyes at Ron and Harry, who knew that if they retaliated they would get detention faster than you could say unfair. Harry's swelling solution was far too runny, but he had his mind on more important things. He was waiting for Hermione's signal, and he hardly listened as Snape paused to sneer at his watery potion. When Snape turned and walked off to bully Neville, Hermione caught Harry's eye and nodded. Harry ducked swiftly down behind his cauldron, pulled one of Fred's filibuster fireworks out of his pocket, and gave it a quick prod with his wand. The firework began to fizz and sputter. Knowing he had only seconds, Harry straightened up, took aim, and lobbed it into the air. It landed right on target in Goyle's cauldron. Goyle's potion exploded, showering the whole class. People shrieked as splashes of the swelling solution hit them. Malfoy got a faceful and his nose began to swell like a balloon. Goyle blundered around, his hands over his eyes, which had expanded to the size of a dinner plate. Snape was trying to restore calm and find out what had happened. Through the confusion, Harry saw Hermione slip quietly into Snape's office. Silence. Silence, Snape roared. Anyone who has been splashed, come here for a deflating draft. When I find out who did this... Harry tried not to laugh as he watched Malfoy hurry forward, his head drooping with the weight of a nose, like a small melon. As half the class lumbered up to Snape's desk, some weighted down with arms like clubs, others unable to talk through gigantic puffed-up lips, Harry saw Hermione slide back into the dungeon, the front of her robes bulging. When everyone had taken a swig of antidote and the very swelling had subsided, Snape swept over to Goyle's cauldron and scooped out the twisted black remains of the firework. There was a sudden hush. If I ever find out who threw this, Snape whispered, I shall make sure that person is expelled. Harry arranged his face into what he hoped was a puzzled expression. Snape was looking right at him, and the bell that rang ten minutes later could not have been more welcome. He knew it was me, Harry told Ron and Hermione as they hurried back to Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. I could tell. Hermione threw the new ingredients into the cauldron and began to stir feverishly. It'll be ready in two weeks, she said happily. Snape can't prove it was you, said Ron reassuringly to Harry. What can he do? Knowing Snape? Something foul said Harry, as the potion frothed and bubbled. A week later, Harry, Ron, and Hermione were walking across the entrance hall when they saw a small knot of people gathered around the notice board, reading a piece of parchment that had just been pinned up. Seamus Finnegan and Dean Thomas beckoned them over, looking excitedly. "'They're starting a dueling club,' said Seamus. First meeting tonight. I wouldn't mind dueling lessons. They might come in handy one of these days.' "'What, you reckon Slytherin's monster can duel?' said Ron, but he too read the sign with interest." Could be useful, he said to Harry and Hermione as they went to dinner. Shall we go? Harry and Hermione were all for it, so at eight o'clock that evening they hurried back to the Great Hall. The long dining tables had vanished, and a golden stage had appeared along one wall, lit by thousands of candles floating overhead. The ceiling was velvety black once more, and most of the school seemed to be packed beneath it, all carrying their wands and looking excited. I wonder who will be teaching us, said Hermione as they edged into the chattering crowd. Someone told me Flitwick was a dueling champion when he was young. Maybe it'll be him. <laughs> as long as it's not, Harry began, but he ended on a groan. Gildory Lockhart was walking onto the stage, resplendent in robes of deep plum and accompanied by none other than Snape, wearing his usual black. Lockhart waved an arm for silence and called, Gather round, gather round. Can everyone see me? Can you all hear me? Excellent. Hmm. Now... Professor Dumbledore has granted me permission to start this little dueling club to train you all in case you ever need to defend yourselves, as I myself have done on countless occasions. Uh, for full details, see my published works. Let me introduce my assistant, Professor Snape, said Lockhart, flashing a wide smile. He tells me he knows a tiny little bit about dueling himself and has sportingly agreed to help me with a short demonstration before we begin. Now, I don't want any of you youngsters to worry. 
You'll still have your potions, Master, when I'm through with him. Never fear. Wouldn't it be good if they finished each other off? Ron muttered in Harry's ear. Snape's upper lip was curling. Harry wondered why Lockhart was still smiling. If Snape had been looking at him like that, he'd have been running as fast as he could in the opposite direction. Lockhart and Snape turned to face each other and bowed. At least Lockhart did, with much twirling of his hands, whereas Snape jerked his head irritably. Then they raised their wands like swords in front of them. As you see, we are holding our wands in the accepted combative position, Lockhart told the silent crowd. On the count of three, we will cast our first spells. Neither of us will be aiming to kill, of course. <laughs> I wouldn't bet on that, Harry murmured, watching Snape baring his teeth. One, two, three. Both of them swung their wands above their heads and pointed them at their opponent. Snape cried, Expelliarmus. There was a dazzling flash of scarlet light and Lockhart was blasted off his feet. He flew backward off the stage, smashed into the wall, and slid down into the sprawl on the floor. Malfoy and some of the other Slytherins cheered. Hermione was dancing on tiptoes. Do you think he's all right? She squealed through her fingers. Who cares? said Harry and Ron together. Lockhart was getting unsteadily to his feet. His hat had fallen off, and his wavy hair was standing on end. Well, there you have it, he said, tottering back onto the platform. That was a disarming charm. As you see, I've lost my wand. Ah, thank you, Miss Brown. Yes, an excellent idea to show them that, Professor Snape, but if you don't mind me saying so, it was very obvious what you were about to do. If I had wanted to stop you, it would have been only too easy. Uh, however, I felt it would be instructive to let them see. Snape was looking murderous. Possibly Lockhart had noticed, because he said, Well, enough demonstrating. I'm going to come amongst you now and put you all into pairs. Professor Snape, if you'd like to help me. They moved through the crowd, matching up partners. Lockhart teamed Neville with Justin Flinch Fletchley, but Snape reached Harry and Ron first. Time to split up the dream team, I think. He sneered. Weasley, you can partner Finnegan. Potter. Harry moved automatically toward Hermione. I don't think so said Snape, smiling coldly. Mr. Malfoy, come over here. Let's see what you make of the famous Potter. And you, Miss Granger, you can partner Miss Bolstrode. Malfoy strutted over, smirking. Behind him walked a Slytherin girl who reminded Harry of a picture he'd seen in Holidays with Hags. She was large and square, and her heavy jaw jutted aggressively. Hermione gave her a weak smile that she did not return. Face your partners, called Lockhart, back on the platform, and bow. Harry and Malfoy barely inclined their heads, not taking their eyes off each other. "'Wands at the ready,' shouted Lockhart. "'When I count to three, cast your charms to disarm your opponents. "'Only to disarm them. "'We don't want any accidents. One, two, three. Harry swung his wand high, but Malfoy had already started on two. His spell hit Harry so hard he felt as though he'd been hit over the head with a saucepan. He stumbled, but everything still seemed to be working, and wasting no more time, Harry pointed his wand straight at Malfoy and shouted, Victim Sempra! A jet of silver light hit Malfoy in the stomach, and he doubled up, wheezing. I said disarm only, Lockhart shouted in alarm over the heads of the battling crowd, as Malfoy sunk to his knees. Harry had hit him with a tickling charm, and he could barely move for laughing. Harry hung back, with a vague feeling it would be unsporting to bewitch Malfoy while he was on the floor. But this was a mistake. Gasping for breath, Malfoy pointed his wand at Harry's knees, choked... Tarantelogra! In the next second, Harry's legs began to jerk around out of his control in a kind of quick step. Stop! Stop! screamed Lockhart, but Snape took charge. Finit incantatum, he shouted. Harry's feet stopped dancing, Malfoy stopped laughing, and they were able to look up. A haze of greenish smoke was hovering over the scene. Both Neville and Justin were lying on the floor, panting. Ron was holding up an ashen faced Seamus, apologizing for whatever his broken wand had done. But Hermione and Millicent Bulstrode were still moving. Millicent had Hermione in a headlock, and Hermione was whimpering in pain. Both their wands lay forgotten on the floor. Harry leapt forward and pulled Millicent off. It was difficult. She was a lot bigger than he was. Dear, dear, said Lockhart, skittering through the crowd, looking at the aftermath of the duels. Up you go, Macmillan. Oh, careful there, Miss Fawcett. Uh, pinch it hard. It'll stop bleeding in a second boot. I think I'd better teach you how to block... "'Unfriendly spells,' said Lockhart, standing flustered in the midst of the hall. He glanced at Snape, whose black eyes glinted, and looked quickly away. Uh, "'Let's have a volunteer pair. Uh, Longbottom and Finch Fletchley, how about you?' "'A bad idea, Professor Lockhart,' said Snape, gliding over like a large and malevolent bat. 
Longbottom causes devastation with the simplest spells. We'll be sending what's left of Finch Fletchley up to the hospital wing in a matchbox. Neville's round pink face went pinker. How about Malfoy and Potter? said Snape with a twisted smile. Excellent idea, said Lockhart, gesturing Harry and Malfoy into the middle of the hall as the crowd backed away to give them room. Now, Harry, said Lockhart, when Draco points his wand at you, you do this. He raised his own wand, attempted a complicated sort of wiggling action, and dropped it. Snape smirked as Lockhart quickly picked it up, saying, Whoops, uh, my wand is a little overexcited. Snape moved closer to Malfoy, bent down, and whispered something in his ear. Malfoy smirked, too. Harry looked up nervously at Lockhart and said, Professor, could you show me that blocking thing again? Scared, muttered Malfoy, so that Lockhart couldn't hear him. You wish, said Harry, out of the corner of his mouth. Lockhart cuffed Harry merrily on the shoulder. <laughs> Just do what I did, Harry. What, drop my wand? But Lockhart wasn't listening. Three, two, one, go, he shouted. Malfoy raised his wand quickly and bellowed, Serpent Sortia! The end of his wand exploded. Harry watched aghast as a long black snake shot, shot out of it, fell heavily onto the floor between them, and raised itself, ready to strike. There were screams as the crowd backed swiftly away, clearing the floor. "'Don't move, Potter,' said Snape lazily, clearly enjoying the sight of Harry standing motionless, eye to eye with the angry snake. "'I'll get rid of—' "'Allow me,' shouted Lockhart. He brandished his wand at the snake, and there was a loud bang. The snake, instead of vanishing, flew ten feet into the air and fell back to the floor with a loud smack. Enraged, hissing furiously, it slithered straight toward Justin Finch Fletchley and raised itself again, fangs exposed, poised to strike. Harry wasn't sure what made him do it. He wasn't even aware of deciding to do it. All he knew was that his legs were carrying him forward as though he was on casters and that he had shouted stupidly at the snake, Leave him alone! And miraculously, inexplicably, the snake slumped to the floor, docile as a thick black garden hose, its eyes now on Harry. Harry felt the fear drain out of him. He knew the snake wouldn't attack anyone now, though how he knew it, he couldn't have explained. He looked up at Justin, grinning, expecting to see Justin looking relieved or puzzled or even grateful, but certainly not angry and scared. "'What do you think you're playing at?' he shouted, and before Harry could say anything, Justin had turned and stormed out of the hall. Snape stepped forward, waved his wand, and the snake vanished in a small puff of black smoke. Snape, too, was looking at Harry in an unexpected way. It was a shrewd and calculating look, and Harry didn't like it. He was also dimly aware of an ominous muttering all around the walls. Then he felt a tugging on the back of his robes. "'Come on,' said Ron's voice in his ear. "'Move, come on!' Ron steered him out of the hall, Hermione hurrying alongside them. As they went through the doors, the people on either side drew away as though they were frightened of catching something. Harry didn't have a clue what was going on, and neither Ron nor Hermione explained anything until they had dragged him all the way up to the empty Gryffindor common room. Then Ron pushed Harry into an armchair and said, "'You're a parcel mouth. Why didn't you tell us?' "'I'm a what?' said Harry. "'A parcel mouth,' said Ron. "'You can talk to snakes?' "'I know,' said Harry. "'I mean, that's only the second time I've ever done it. "'I accidentally set a boa constrictor on my cousin, Dudley, at the zoo once. "'Long story. "'But it was telling me it had never seen Brazil, "'and I sort of set it free without meaning to. "'That was before I knew I was a wizard.' "'A boa constrictor told you it had never seen Brazil,' Ron repeated faintly. So, said Harry, I bet loads of people here can do it. Oh no, they can't, said Ron. It's not a very common gift, Harry. This is bad. What's bad, said Harry, starting to feel quite angry. What's wrong with everyone? Listen, if I hadn't told that snake not to attack Justin... Oh, that's what you said to it? What do you mean? You were there. You heard me. I heard you speaking parcel tongue, said Ron. Snake language. You could have been saying anything. No wonder Justin panicked. You sounded like you were egging the snake on or something. It was creepy, you know? Harry gaped at him. I spoke a different language? But I didn't realize. How can I speak a language without knowing I can speak it? Ron shook his head. Both he and Hermione were looking as though s someone had died. Harry couldn't see what was so terrible. Do you want to tell me what's wrong with stopping a massive snake biting off Justin's head? He said. What does it matter how I did it as long as Justin doesn't have to join the headless hunt? It matters, said Hermione, speaking at last in a hushed voice, because being able to talk to snakes was what Salazar Slytherin was famous for. That's why the symbol of Slytherin House is a serpent. Harry's mouth fell open. Exactly, said Ron. 
and now the whole school is going to think you're his great, 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 great grandson or something. But I'm not, said Harry, with a panic he couldn't quite explain. You'll find that hard to prove, said Hermione. He lived about a thousand years ago. For all we know, you could be. Harry lay awake for hours that night. Through a gap in the curtains around his four-poster, he watched snow starting to drift past the tower window and wondered, could he be a descendant of Salazar Slytherin? He didn't know anything about his father's family, after all. The Dursleys had always forbidden questions about his wizarding relatives. Quietly, Harry tried to say something in parcel tongue. The words wouldn't come. It seemed he had to be face to face with the snake to do it. But I'm in Gryffindor, Harry thought. The sorting hat wouldn't have put me in here if I had Slytherin blood. Ah, said a nasty little voice in his brain. But the sorting hat wanted to put you in Slytherin, don't you remember? Harry turned over. He'd see Justin the next day in Herbology, and he'd explain that he'd been calling the snake off, not egging it on, which, he thought angrily, pummeling his pillow, any fool should have realized. By next morning, however, the snow that had begun in the night had turned into a blizzard so thick that the last Herbology lesson of the term was cancelled. Professor Sprout wanted to fit socks and scarves on the mandrakes, a tricky operation she would entrust to no one else, now that it wasn't so important for the mandrakes to grow quickly and revive Mrs. Norris and Gollum Creevy. Harry fretted about this next to the fire in the Gryffindor common room, while Ron and Hermione used their time off to play a game of wizard chess. "'For heaven's sake, Harry,' said Hermione, exasperated as one of Ron's bishops wrestled her knight off his horse and dragged him off the board. "'Go and find Justin if it's so important to you.' So Harry got up and left through the portrait hole, wondering where Justin might be. The castle was darker than it usually was in daytime because of the thick, swirling gray snow at every window. Shivering, Harry walked past classrooms where lessons were taking place, catching snatches of what was happening within. Professor McGonagall was shouting at someone who, by the sound of it, had turned his friend into a badger. Resisting the urge to take a look, Harry walked on by, thinking that Justin might be using his free time to catch up on some work and deciding to check the library first. A group of the Hufflepuffs who should have been in her biology were indeed sitting at the back of the library, but they didn't seem to be working. Between the long lines of high bookshelves, Harry could see that their heads were close together and they were having what looked like an absorbing conversation. He couldn't see whether Justin was among them. He was walking toward them when something of what they were saying met his ears, and he paused to listen, hidden in the invisibility section. So anyway, a stop boy was saying, I told Justin to hide up in our dormitory. I mean to say, if Potter's marked him down as his next victim, it's best if he keeps a low profile for a while. Of course, Justin's been want waiting for something like this to happen ever since he let slip to Potter he was a muggle-born. Justin actually told him he'd be down for Eden. That's not the kind of thing you'd bandy about with Slytherin's heir on the loose, is it? You definitely think it is Potter then, Ernie? said a girl with blonde pigtails anxiously. Hannah, said the stout boy solemnly. He's a parcel mouth. Everyone knows that the mark of a dark wizard. Have you ever heard of a decent one who could talk to snakes? They called Slytherin himself Serpent Tongue. There was some heavy murmuring at this, and Ernie went on. Remember what was written on the wall? Enemies of the air, beware. Potter had some sort of run in with Filch. Next thing we know, Filch's cats attacked. That first year, Cravey was annoying Potter at the Quidditch match, taking pictures of him while he was lying in the mud. Next thing we know, Cravey's been attacked. He always seems so nice, though, said Hannah uncertainly. And, well, he's the one who made you know who disappear. He can't be all bad, can he? Ernie lo lowered his voice mysteriously. The Hufflepuffs bent closer, and Harry edged near so that he could catch Ernie's words. No one knows how he survived that attack by you know who. I mean to say, he was only a baby when it happened. He should have been blasted into smithereens. Only a really powerful dark wizard could have survived a curse like that. He dropped his voice until it was barely more than a whisper and said, That's probably why you know who wanted to kill him in the first place. Didn't, didn't want another Dark Lord competing with him. I wonder what other powers Potter's been hiding. Harry couldn't take any more. Clearing his throat loudly, he stepped out from behind the bookshelves. If he hadn't been feeling so angry, he would have found the sight of the... that greeted him funny. Every one of the Hufflepuffs looked as though they had been petrified by the sight of him, and the color was draining out of Ernie's face. Hello, said Harry. I'm looking for Justin Flinch Fleshley. The Hufflepuffs' worst fears had clearly been confirmed. They all looked fearfully at Ernie. "'What do you want with him?' said Ernie in a quavering voice. "'I wanted to tell him what really happened with that snake at the dueling club,' said Harry. Ernie bit his white lips and then, taking a deep breath, said, "'We were all there. We saw what happened.' "'Then you noticed that after I spoke to it, the snake backed off?' said Harry. 
All I saw, said Ernie stubbornly, though he was trembling as he spoke, was you speaking parcel tongue and chasing the snake toward Justin. I didn't chase it at him, Harry said, his voice shaking with anger. I didn't even touch him. It was a very near miss, said Ernie, and in case you're getting ideas, he added hastily, I might tell you that you can trace my family back through nine generations of witches and warlocks, and my blood's as pure as anyone's, so... I don't care what sort of blood you've got, said Harry fiercely. Why do I want to attack Muggleborns? I've heard you hate those muggles you live with, said Ernie swiftly. It's not possible to live with the Dursleys and not hate them, said Harry. I'd like to see you try it. He turned on his heel and stormed out of the library, earning himself a reproving glare from Madame Pince, who was polishing the gilded cover of a large spell book. Harry blundered up the corridor, barely noticing where he was going, he was in such a fury. The result was that he walked into something very large and solid, which knocked him backwards onto the floor. Oh, hello, Hagrid, Harry said, looking up. Hagrid's face was entirely hidden by a woolly snow-covered bal balaclava, but it couldn't possibly be anyone else, as he filled most of the corridor in his moleskin overcoat. A dead rooster was hanging from one of his massive gloved hands. All right, Harry, he said, pulling up the balaclava so he could speak. Why aren't you in class? Cancelled, said Harry, getting up. What are you doing in here? Hagrid held up the limp rooster. The second one killed this term, he explained. It's either foxes or a blood-sucking bugbear, and I need the headmaster's permission to put up a charm round a hen coop. He peered more closely at Harry from under his thick, snow-flecked eyebrows. You sure you're all right? You look like all hot and bothered. Harry couldn't bring himself to repeat what Ernie and the rest of the Hufflepuffs had been saying about him. It's nothing, he said. I better get going, Hagrid. It's Transfiguration next, and I've got to pick up my books. He walked off, his mind still full of what, full of what Ernie had said about him. Justin's been waiting for something like this to happen ever since he let slip to Potter he was muggle-born. Harry stamped up the stairs and turned along another corridor, which was particularly dark. The torches had been extinguished by a strong icy draft that was blowing through a loose window pane. He was halfway down the passage when he tripped headlong over something lying on the floor. He turned to squid at what he'd fallen over and felt as though his stomach had dissolved. Justin Finch Fletchley was lying on the floor, rigid and cold, a look of shock frozen on his face, his eyes staring blankly at the ceiling, and that wasn't all. Next to him was another figure, the strangest sight Harry had ever seen. He was nearly headless Nick, no longer pearly white and transparent, but black and smoky, floating immobile and horizontal, six inches off the floor. His head was half off, and his face wore an expression of shock identical to Justin's. Harry got to his feet, his breathing fast and shallow, his heart doing a kind of drum roll against his ribs. He looked wildly up and down the deserted corridor and saw a line of spiders scuttling as fast as they could away from the bodies. The only sounds were the muffled voices of teachers from the classes on either side. He could run, and no one would ever know he had been there, but he couldn't just leave them lying here. He had to get help. Would anyone believe he hadn't anything to do with this? As he stood there, panicking, a door right next to him opened with a bang. Peeves the poltergeist came shooting out. "'Why, it's Potty Weedy Potter!' cackled Peeves, knocking Harry's glasses askew as he bounced past him. "'What's Potter up to? Why is Potter lurking?' Peeves stopped, halfway through a mid-air somersault. Upside down, he spotted Justin in nearly headless Nick. He flipped the right way up, filled his lungs, and before Harry could stop him, screamed, "'Attack! Attack! Another attack! No mortal or ghost is safe! Run for your lives! Attack!' Crash, crash, crash. Door after door flew open along the corridor, and people flooded out. For several long minutes, there was a scene of such confusion that Justin was in danger of being squashed and people kept standing in nearly headless Nick. Harry found himself pinned against the walls. The teacher shouted for quiet. Professor McGonagall came running, followed by her own class, one of whom still had black and white striped hair. She used her wand to set off a loud bang, which restored silence, and ordered everyone back into their classes. No sooner had the scene cleared somewhat that Ernie the Hufflepuff arrived, panting on the scene. Caught in the act, Ernie yelled, his face stark white, pointing his finger dramatically at Harry. That will do, Macmillan, said Professor McGonagall sharply. Peeves was bobbing overhead now, grinning wickedly, surveying the scene. Peeves always loved chaos. As the teachers bent over Justin and nearly headless Nick, examining them, Peeves broke into song. Oh, Potter, you rotter. Oh, what have you done? You're killing off students who think it's good fun. That's enough, Peeves, barked Professor McGonagall, and Pref Peeves zoomed away backward with his tongue out at Harry. Justin was carried up to the hospital wing by Professor Flitwick and Professor Sinistra of the astronomy department, but nobody seemed to know what to do for nearly headless Nick. In the end, Professor McGonagall conjured a large fan out of thin air, which she gave to Ernie with instructions to waft nearly headless Nick up the stairs. This Ernie did, fanning Nick along like a silent black hovercraft. This left Harry and Professor McGonagall alone together. "'This way, Potter,' she said. "'Professor,' said Harry at once. 
I swear I didn't. This is out of my hands, Potter, said Professor McGonagall curtly. They marched in silence around a corner, and she stopped before a large and extremely ugly stone gargoyle. Lemon drop, she said. This was evidently a password, because the gargoyle sprang suddenly to life and hopped aside as the wall behind him split in two. Even full of dread for what was coming, Harry couldn't fail to be amazed. Behind the wall was a spiral staircase that was moving smoothly upward like an escalator. As he and Professor McGonagall stepped onto it, Harry heard the wall thud close behind them. They rose upward in circles, higher and higher until at last, slightly dizzy. Harry saw a gleaming oak door ahead with a brass knocker in the shape of a griffin. He knew now where he was being taken. This must be where Dumbledore lived. Chapter 12 The Polyjuice Potion They stepped off the stone staircase at the top, and Professor McGonagall rapped on the door. It opened silently and they entered. Professor McGonagall told Harry to wait and left him there, alone. Harry looked around. One thing was certain. Of all the teacher's offices Harry had visited so far this year, Dumbledore's was by far the most interesting. If he hadn't been scared out of his wits that he was about to be thrown out of school, he would have been very pleased to have a chance to look around. It was a large and beautiful circular room, full of funny little noises. A number of curious silver instruments stood on spindle-like tables, whirring and emitting little puffs of smoke. The walls were covered with portraits of old headmasters and headmistresses, all of whom were snoozing gently in their frames. There was also an enormous claw-footed desk, and, sitting on a shelf behind it, a shabby, tattered wizard's hat. The sorting hat. Harry hesitated. He cast a wary eye around the sleeping witches and wizards on the wall. Surely it couldn't hurt if he took the hat down and tried it on again. Just to see. Just to make sure it had put him in the right house. He walked quietly around the desk, lifted the hat from its shelf, and lowered it slowly onto his head. It was much too large and slipped down over his eyes, just as it had done the last time he'd put it on. Harry stared at the black inside of the hat, waiting. Then a small voice said in his ear, "'Be in your bonner, Harry Potter?' "'Er, yes,' Harry muttered. Mm. "'Sorry to bother you. I wanted to ask. "'You've been wondering whether I put you in the right house?' said the hat smartly. "'Yes. You were particularly difficult to place. "'But I stand by what I said before.' Harry's heart leapt. "'You would have done well in Slytherin.' Harry's stomach plummeted. He grabbed the point of the hat and pulled it off. It hung limply in his hand, grubby and faded. Harry pushed it back onto its shelf, feeling sick. "'You're wrong,' he said aloud to the still and silent hat. It didn't move. Harry backed away, watching it. Then a strange, gagging noise behind him made him wheel around. He wasn't alone after all. Standing on a golden perch behind the door was a decrepit-looking bird that resembled a half-plucked turkey. Harry stared at it, and the bird looked balefully back, making its gagging noise again. Harry thought it looked very ill. Its eyes were dull, and even as Harry watched, a couple more feathers fell off its tail. Harry was just thinking that all he needed was for Dumbledore's pet bird to die while he was alone in the office with it when the bird burst into flames. Harry yelled in shock and backed away into the desk. He looked feverishly loud in case there was a glass of water somewhere but couldn't see one. The bird, meanwhile, had become a fireball. It gave one loud shriek and the next second there was nothing but a smoldering pile of ash on the floor. The office door opened. Dumbledore came in looking very somber. Professor, Harry gasped, your bird. I couldn't do anything. He just caught fire. To Harry's astonishment, Dumbledore smiled. "'About time, too,' he said. "'He's been looking dreadful for days. I've been telling him to get a move on.' He chuckled at the stunned look on Harry's face. "'Fox is a phoenix, Harry. Phoenix burst into flames when it is time for them to die, and are reborn from the ashes. Watch him.' Harry looked down in time to see a tiny, wrinkled, newborn bird poke its head out of the ashes. It was quite as ugly as the old one. "'It's a shame you had to see him on a burning day,' said Dumbledore, seating himself behind his desk. "'He's really very handsome most of the time. Wonderful red and glowed plumage. A fascinating creature's phoenixes. They can carry immensely heavy loads, their tears have healing powers, and they make highly faithful pets.' In the shock of Fox catching fire, Harry had forgotten what he was there for, but it all came back to him as Dumbledore settled himself on the high chair behind the desk and fixed Harry with his penetrating light blue stare. Before Dumbledore could speak another word, however, the door of his office flew open with an almighty bang and Hagrid burst in, a wild look in his eyes, his balaclava perched on top of his shaggy black head and the dead rooster still swinging from his hand. "'It wasn't Harry, Professor Dumbledore,' said Hagrid urgently. "'I was talking to him seconds before that kid was found. He never had time, sir.' 
Dumbledore tried to say something, but Hagrid went ranting on, waving the rooster around in his agitation, sending feathers everywhere. It can't have been him. I swear it in front of all the Ministry of Magic if I have to. Hagrid, I... You've got the wrong boy, sir. I know Harry never... Hagrid, said Dumbledore loudly. I do not think that Harry attacked those people. Oh, said Hagrid, the rooster falling limply at his side. Right. I'll wait outside then, Headmaster. He stomped out, looking embarrassed. You don't think it was me, Professor? Harry repeated hopefully as Dumbledore brushed Rooster Feathers off his desk. No, Harry, I don't, said Dumbledore, though his face was somber again. But I still want to talk to you. Harry waited nervously while Dumbledore considered him, the tip of his long fingers together. I must ask you, Harry, whether there is anything you'd like to tell me, he said gently. Anything at all. Harry didn't know what to say. He thought of Malfoy shouting, You'll be next, mudbloods! and of the polyjuice potion simmering away in Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. Then he thought of the disembodied voice he had heard twice and remembered what Ron had said. Hearing voices no one else can hear isn't a good sign, even in the wizarding world. He thought, too, about what everyone was saying about him, and his growing dread that he was somehow connected with Salazar Slytherin. No, said Harry. There isn't anything, Professor. The double attack on Justin and nearly headless Nick turned what had hit her been nervousness into real panic. Curiously, it was nearly headless Nick's fate that seemed to worry people most. What could possibly do that to a ghost? People asked each other. What terrible power could harm someone who was already dead? There was almost a stampede to book seats on the Hogwarts Express so that students could go home for Christmas. At this rate, we'll be the only ones left, Ron told Harry and Hermione. Us, Malfoy, Crab, and Coyle. What a jolly holiday it's going to be. Crab and Coyle, who always did whatever Malfoy did, had signed up to stay over the holidays, too. But Harry was glad that most people were leaving. He was tired of people skirting around him in the corridors, as though he was about to sprout fangs or spit poison, tired of all the muttering, pointing, and hissing as he passed. Fred and George, however, found all of this very funny. They went out of their way to march ahead of Harry down the corridor, shouting, Make way for the heir of Slytherin! Seriously evil wizard coming through! Percy was deeply disapproving of this behavior. It is not a laughing matter, he said coldly. Oh, get out of the way, Percy, said Fred. Harry's in a hurry! Yeah, he's off to the Chamber of Secrets for a cup of tea with his fang servant, said George, chortling. Jeannie didn't find it amusing either. Oh, don't, she wailed every time Fred asked Harry loudly who he was planning to attack next, or when George pretended to ward Harry off with a large clove of garlic when they met. Harry didn't mind. It made him feel better that Fred and George, at least, thought the idea of his being Slytherin's heir was quite ludicrous, but their antics seemed to be aggravating Draco Malfoy, who looked increasingly sour each time he saw them at it. It's because he's bursting to say it's really him, said Ron knowingly. You know how he hates anyone beating him at anything, and you're getting all the credit for his dirty work. Not for long, said Hermione in a satisfied tone. The polyjuice potion's nearly ready. We'll be getting the truth out of him any day now. At last, the term ended, and a silence deep as the snow on the grounds descended on the castle. Harry found it peaceful rather than gloomy, and enjoyed the fact that he, Hermione, and the Weasleys had the run of Gryffindor Tower, which meant they could play Exploding Snap loudly without bothering anyone, and practice dueling in private. Fred, George, and Ginny had chosen to stay at school rather than visit Bill in Egypt with Mr. and Mrs. Weasley. Percy, who disapproved of what he termed their childish behavior, didn't spend much time in the Gryffindor common room. He had already told them pompously that he was only staying over Christmas because it was his duty as a prefect to support the teachers during this troubled time. Christmas morning dawned, cold and white. Harry and Ron, the only ones left in their dormitory, were woken very early by Hermione, who burst in, fully dressed and carrying presents for them both. "'Wake up!' she said loudly, pulling back the curtains at the window. "'Hermione, you're not supposed to be in here,' said Ron, shielding his eyes against the light. "'Merry Christmas to you, too,' said Hermione, throwing him his present. "'I've been up for nearly an hour, adding more lace wings to the potion. It's ready.' Harry sat up, suddenly wide awake. "'Are you sure?' Positive, said Hermione, shifting Scabbers the rat so that she could sit down on the end of Ron's four-poster. If we're going to do it, I'd say it should be tonight. At that moment, Hedwig swooped into the room, carrying a very small package in her beak. Hello, said Harry happily as she landed on his bed. Are you speaking to me again? She nibbled his ear in an affectionate sort of way, which was a far better present than the one that she had brought him, which turned out to be from the Dursleys. They had sent Harry a toothpick and a note telling him to find out whether he'd be able to stay at Hogwarts for the summer vacation, too. The rest of Harry's Christmas presents were far more satisfactory. Hagrid sent him a large tin of treacle fudge, which Harry decided to soften by the fire before eating. Ron had given him a book called Flying with the Cannons, a book of interesting facts about his favorite Quidditch team, and Hermione had bought him a luxury eagle feather quill. 
Harry opened the last present to find a new, hand-knitted sweater from Mrs. Weasley and a large plum cake. He read her card with a fresh surge of guilt, thinking about Mr. Weasley's car, which hadn't been seen since its crash with the Whomping Willow, and the bout of rule-breaking he and Ron were planning next. No one, not even someone dreading taking Polyjuice Potion later, could fail to enjoy Christmas dinner at Hogwarts. The Great Hall looked magnificent. Not only were there a dozen frost-covered Christmas trees and thick streamers of holly and mistletoe crisscrossing the ceiling, but enchanted snow was falling, warm and dry from the ceiling. Dumbledore led them in a few of his favorite carols, Hagrid booming more and more loudly with every goblet of eggnog he consumed. Percy, who hadn't noticed that Fred had bewitched his prefect badge so that it now read Pinheads, kept asking them all what they were sniggering at. Harry didn't even care that Draco Malfoy was making loud, snide remarks about his new sweater from the Slytherin table. With a bit of luck, Malfoy would be getting his comeuppance in a few hours' time. Harry and Ron had barely finished their third helpings of Christmas pudding when Hermione ushered them out of the hall to finalize their plans for the evening. "'We still need a bit of the people you're changing into,' said Hermione matter-of-factly, as though she were sending them to the supermarket for laundry detergent. "'And obviously, it'll be best if you can get something of crabs and goyles. They're Malfoy's best friends. He'll tell them anything. And we also need to make sure the real crab and goyle can't burst in on us while we're interrogating him.' "'I've got it all worked out,' she went on smoothly, ignoring Harry and Ron's stupefied faces. She held up two plump chocolate cakes. "'I've filled these with a simple sleeping drought. All you have to do is make sure Crab and Goyle find them. You know how greedy they are. They're bound to eat them. Once they're asleep, pull out a few of their hairs and hide them in a broom closet.' Harry and Ron looked incredulously at each other. "'Hermione, I don't think... that could go seriously wrong.' but Hermione had a steely glint in her eye, not unlike the one Professor McGonagall sometimes had. "'The potion will be useless without Crab and Goyle's hair,' she said sternly. "'You do want to investigate Malfoy, don't you?' "'Oh, all right, all right,' said Harry. "'But what about you? Whose hair are you ripping out?' "'I've already got mine,' said Hermione brightly, pulling a tiny bottle out of her pocket and showing them the single hair inside it. "'Remember Millicent Bolstrode wrestling with me at the dueling club? She left this on my robes when she was trying to strangle me.' and she's gone home for Christmas, so I'll just have to tell the Slytherins I've decided to come back. When Hermione had bustled off to check on the Polyjuice potion again, Ron turned to Harry with a doom-laden expression. Have you ever heard of a plan where so many things could go wrong? But to Harry's and Ron's utter amazement, stage one of the operation went just as smoothly as Hermione had said. They lurked in the deserted entrance hall after Christmas tea, waiting for Crab and Goyle, who had remained alone at the Slytherin table, shoveling down fourth helpings of Triffle. Harry had perched the chocolate cakes on the end of the banisters. When they spotted Crab and Goyle coming out of the Great Hall, Harry and Ron hid quickly behind a suit of armor next to the front door. "'How thick can you get?' Ron whispered ecstatically as Crab gleefully pointed out the cakes to Goyle and grabbed them. Grinning stupidly, they stuffed the cakes whole into their large mouths. For a moment, both of them chewed greedily, looks of triumph on their faces. Then, without the smallest change of expression, they both keeled over backward onto the floor." By far the hardest part was hiding them in the closet across the hall. Once they were safely stowed among the buckets and mops, Harry yanked out a couple of the bristles that covered Goyle's forehead, and Ron pulled out several of Crab's hairs. They also stole their shoes, because their own were far too small for Crab and Goyle-sized feet. Then, still stunned at what they had just done, they sprinted up to Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. They could hardly see for the thick black smoke issuing from the stall in which Hermione was stirring the cauldron. Pulling their robes up over their faces, Harry and Ron knocked softly on the door. Hermione? They heard the scrape of the lock and Hermione emerged, shiny-faced and looking anxious. Behind her, they heard the gloop-gloop of the bubbling, glutinous potion. Three glass tumblers stood ready on the toilet seat. "'Did you get them?' Hermione asked breathlessly. Harry showed her Goyle's hair. "'Good. And I sneaked these spare robes out of the laundry,' Hermione said, holding up a small sack. "'You'll need bigger sizes once you're crab and Goyle.' The three of them stared into the cauldron. Close up, the potion looked like thick, dark mud bubbling sluggishly. I'm sure I've done everything right, said Hermione nervously, rereading the splotched page of most potent potions. It looks like the book says it should. Once we've drunk it, we'll have exactly one hour before we change back into ourselves. Now what? Ron whispered. We separate it into three glasses and add the hairs. Hermione ladled large dollops of the potion into each of the glasses. Then, her hand trembling, she took Millicent Bulstrode's hair out of its bottle into the first glass. The potion hissed loudly like a boiling kettle and frothed madly. A second later, it had turned a sick sort of yellow. Ugh, it's essence of Millicent Bulstrode, said Ron, eyeing it with loathing. Bet it tastes disgusting. Add yours, then, said Hermione. Harry dropped a goyle's hair into the middle glass, and Ron put gra- crabs into the last one. Both glasses hissed and frothed. 
Gulls turned into the khaki color of a booger. Crabs a dark, murky brown. Hang on, said Harry as Ron and Hermione reached for their glasses. We better not all drink them in here. Once we turn into Crab and Goyle, we won't fit. And Millicent and Bostrode's no pixie. Good thinking, said Ron, unlocking the door. We'll take separate stalls. Careful not to spill a drop of his polyjuice potion, Harry slipped into the middle stall. Ready? he called. Ready, came Ron and Hermione's voices. One, two, three. Pinching his nose, Harry drank the potion down in two large gulps. It tasted like overcooked cabbage. Immediately, his insides started writhing as though he'd just swallowed live snakes. Doubled up, he wondered whether he was going to be sick. Then a burning sensation spread rapidly from his stomach to the very ends of his fingers and toes. Next, bringing him gasping to all fours, came a horrible melting feeling as the skin all over his body bubbled like hot wax. And before his eyes, his hands began to grow. The fingers thickened, the nails broadened, the knuckles were bulging like bolts. His shoulders stretched painfully, and a prickling on his forehead told him that hair was creeping down toward his eyebrows. His robes ripped at his chest expanded like a barrel bursting its hoops. His feet were agony in sizes, shoes four sizes too small. As suddenly as it started, everything stopped. Harry lay face down on the stone-cold floor, listening to Myrtle gurgling morosely in the end toilet. With difficulty, he kicked off his shoes and stood up. So this is what it felt like, being Goyle. His large hand trembling, he pulled off his old robes, which were hanging a foot above his ankle, pulled on the spare ones, and laced up Goyle's boat-like shoes. He reached up to brush his hair out of his eyes and met only the short growth of wiry bristles low on his forehead. Then he realized that his glasses were clouding his eyes because Goyle obviously didn't need them. He took them off and called. Are you two okay? Goyle's little rasp of a voice issued from his mouth. Yeah, came the deep grunt of crab from his right. Harry unlocked his door and stepped in front of the cracked mirror. Goyle stared back at him out of a dull, deepest set eyes. Harry scratched his ear. So did Goyle. Ron's door opened. They stared at each other, except that he looked pale and shocked. Ron was indistinguishable from Crab, from the pudding bowl haircut to the long gorilla arms. This is unbelievable, said Ron, approaching the mirror and prodding Crab's flat nose. Unbelievable. We'd better get going, said Harry, loosening the watch that was cutting into Goyle's thick wrist. We've still got to find out where the Slytherin common room is. I only hope we can find someone to follow. Ron, who had been gazing at Harry, said, You don't know how bizarre it is to see Goyle thinking. He banged on Hermione's door. Come on, we need to go. A high-pitched voice answered him. I... I don't think I'm going to come after all. You go on without me. Uh, Hermione, we know Millicent Bulstrode's ugly. No one's going to know it's you... No, uh, really. I don't think I'll come. You two hurry up. You're wasting time. Harry looked at Ron, bewildered. That looks more like Goyle, said Ron. That's how he looks every time a teacher asks him a question. Hermione, are you okay? Said Harry through the door. Uh, Fine. I'm fine. Go on. Harry looked at his watch. Five of their precious sixty minutes had already passed. "'We'll meet you back here, all right?' he said. Harry and Ron opened the door of the bathroom carefully, checked that the coast was clear, and set off. "'Don't swing your arms like that,' Harry muttered to Ron. "'Eh?' The crab holds them sort of stiff. "'How's this?' "'Yeah, that's better.' They went down the marble staircase. All they needed now was a Slytherin that they could follow to the Slytherin common room, but there was nobody around. "'Any ideas?' muttered Harry. The Slytherins always come up to breakfast from over there, said Ron, nodding at the entrance to the dungeons. The words had barely left his mouth when a girl with long curly hair emerged from the entrance. Excuse me, said Ron, hurrying up to her. We've forgotten the way to our common room. I beg your pardon, said the girl stiffly. Our common room? I'm a Ravenclaw. She walked away, looking suspiciously back at them. Harry and Ron hurried down the stone steps into the darkness, their footsteps echoing particularly loudly as Crab and Goyle's huge feet hit the floor feeling that this wasn't going to be as easy as they had hoped. The labyrinthian passages were deserted. They walked deeper and deeper under the school, constantly checking their watches to see how much time they had left. After a quarter of an hour, just when they were getting desperate, they heard a sudden movement ahead. Ha! said Ron excitedly. There's one of them now. The figure was emerging from a side room. As they hurried nearer, however, their hearts sank. It wasn't a Slytherin. It was Percy. What are you doing down here? said Ron in surprise. Percy looked affronted. Uh, that, he said stiffly, is none of your business. It's Crab, isn't it? Uh, what? Oh, uh, yeah, said Ron. Well, get off to your dormitories, said Percy sternly. It's not safe to go wandering around dark corridors these days. You are, Ron pointed out. I, said Percy, drawing himself up, am a prefect. Nothing's about to attack me. A voice suddenly echoed behind Harry and Ron. Draco Malfoy was strolling toward them, and for the first time in his life, Harry was pleased to see him. 
There you are, he drawled, looking at them. Have you two been pigging out in the Great Hall all this time? I've been looking for you. I want to show you something really funny. Malfoy glanced witheringly at Percy. And what are you doing down here, Weasley? He sneered. Percy looked outraged. You want to show a bit more respect to a school prefect, he said. I don't like your attitude. Malfoy sneered and motioned for Harry and Ron to follow him. Harry almost said something apologetic to Percy, but caught himself just in time. He and Ron hurried after Malfoy, who said as they turned into the next passage, That Peter Weasley... Percy, Ron corrected him automatically. Whatever, said Malfoy. I've noticed him sneaking around a lot lately, and I bet I know what he's up to. I think he thinks he's going to catch Slytherin's air single-handed. He gave a short, derisive laugh. Harry and Ron exchanged excited looks. Malfoy paused by a stretch of bare, damp stone wall. What's the new password again? He said to Harry. Uh, said Harry. Oh yeah, pure blood, said Malfoy, not listening, and a stone door concealed in the wall slid open. Malfoy marched through it, and Harry and Ron followed him. The Slytherin common room was a long, low underground room with rough stone walls and ceiling from which round, greenish lamps were hanging on chains. A fire was crackling under an elaborately carved mantelpiece ahead of them, and several Slytherins were silhouetted around it in high-backed chairs. Wait here said Malfoy to Harry and Ron, motioning them to a pair of empty chairs set back from the fire. I'll go and get it. My father's just sent it to me. Wondering if Malfoy was going to show them, Harry and Ron sat down, doing their best to look at home. Malfoy came back a minute later, holding what looked like a newspaper clipping. He thrust it under Ron's nose. That'll give you a laugh, he said. Harry saw Ron's eyes widen in shock. He read the clipping quickly, gave a very forced laugh, and handed it to Harry. It had been clipped out of the Daily Prophet, and it said, Inquiry at the Ministry of Magic. Arthur Weasley, head of the Misuse of Muggle Artifacts Office, was today fined 50 galleons for bewitching a muggle car. Mr. Lucius Malfoy, a governor of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, where, he where the enchanted car crashed earlier this year, called today for Mr. Weasley's resignation. Weasley has brought the ministry into disrepute, Mr. Malfoy told our reporter. He is clearly unfit to draw up our laws and his ridiculous muggle protection act should be scrapped immediately. Mr. Weasley was unavailable for comment, although his wife told reporters to clear off or she'd set the family ghoul on them. <laughs> well, said Malfoy impatiently as Harry handed the clipping back to him, don't you think it's funny? Ha ha ha, said Harry bleakly. Arthur Weasley loves muggles so much he should snap his wand in half and go and join them, said Malfoy scornfully. You'd never know the Weasleys with purebloods the way they behave. Ron's, or rather Crab's, face was contorted with fury. What's up with you, Crab? snapped Malfoy. Stomach ache. Ron grunted. "'Well, go up to the hospital wing and give all those mudbloods a kick from me,' said Malfoy, snickering. "'You know, I'm surprised the Daily Prophet hasn't reported all these attacks yet,' he went on thoughtfully. "'I suppose Dumbledore's trying to hush it all up. He'll be sacked if it doesn't stop soon. Father's always said old Dumbledore's the worst thing that's ever happened to this place. He loves Muggleborns. A decent headmaster would never let slime like that creevy in.' Malfoy started talking, taking pictures with an imaginary camera and did a cruel but accurate impression of Colin. Potter, can I have your picture, Potter? Can I have your autograph? Can I lick your shoes, please, Potter? He dropped his hands and looked at Harry and Ron. What's the matter with you two? Far too late, Harry and Ron forced themselves to laugh, but Malfoy seemed satisfied. Perhaps Crabbe and Gory were always slow in the uptake. Saint Potter, the mudblood's friend, said Malfoy slowly. He's another one with no proper wizard feeling, or he wouldn't go around with that jumped-up grange of mudblood. And people think he's Slytherin's heir. Harry and Ron waited with bated breath. Malfoy was surely seconds away from telling them it was him, but then... I wish I knew who it was, said Malfoy petitantly. I could help them. Ron's jaw dropped so that Crab looked even more clueless than usual. Fortunately, Malfoy didn't notice, and Harry, thinking fast, said, You must have some idea who's behind it all. You know I haven't, Goyle. How many times do I have to tell you? snapped Malfoy. And Father won't tell me anything about the last time the chamber was opened, either. Of course, it was fifty years ago, so it was before his time, but he knows all about it, and he says it was all kept quiet, and it'll look suspicious if I know too much about it. But I know one thing. Last time the Chamber of Secrets was opened, a mudblood died, so I bet it's a matter of time before one of them's killed this time. I hope it's Granger, he said with relish. Ron was clenching Crab's gigantic fist. Feeling that it would be a bit of a giveaway if Ron punched Malfoy, Harry shot him a warning look and said, Do you know the pers if the person who opened the chamber last time was caught? No. Oh. Yeah. Whoever it was was expelled, said Malfoy. They're probably still in Azkaban. Azkaban, said Harry, puzzled. Azkaban? The wizard prison, Goyle, said Malfoy, looking at him in disbelief. Honestly, if you were any slower, you'd be going backward. 
He shifted restlessly in his chair and said, Father says to keep my head down and let the air slither and get on with it. He says the school needs ridding of all the mudblood filth, but not to get mixed up in it. Of course, he's got a lot on his plate at the moment. You know the Ministry of Magic raided our manor last week. Harry tried to force Goyle's dull face into a look of concern. Yeah, said Malfoy. Luckily, they didn't find much. Father's got some very valuable dark art stuff, but luckily we've got our own secret chamber under the drawing room floor. Ho, oh, said Ron. Malfoy lifted him. So did Harry. Ron blushed. Even his hair was turning red. His nose was slowly lengthening. Their hour was up. Ron was turning back into himself, and from the look of horror he was suddenly giving Harry, he must be too. They both jumped to their feet. Medicine for my stomach, Ron grunted, and without further ado, they sprinted the length of the Slytherin common room, hurled themselves at the stone wall, and dashed up the passage, hoping against hope that Malfoy hadn't noticed anything. Harry could feel his feet slipping around in Goyle's huge shoes, and had to hoist up his robes as he shrank. They crashed up the steps into the dark entrance hall, which was full of a muffled pounding coming from the closet where they'd locked Crab and Goyle. Leaving their shoes outside the closet door, they sprinted in their socks up the marble staircase toward Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. Well, it wasn't a complete waste of time, Ron panted, closing the bathroom door behind them. I know we still haven't found out who's doing the attacks, but I'm going to write to Dad tomorrow and tell him to check under the Malfoy's drawing room. Harry checked his face in the cracked mirror. He was back to normal. He put his glasses on as Ron hammered on the door of Hermione's stall. Hermione, come out. We've got loads to tell you. Go away, Hermione squeaked. Harry and Ron looked at each other. What's the matter, said Ron. You must be back to normal by now. We are. But Moaning Myrtle glided suddenly through the stall door. Harry had never seen her looking so happy. Ooh, wait till you see, she said. It's awful. They heard the lock slide back and Hermione emerged, sobbing, her ropes pulled up over her head. What's up, said Ron uncertainly. Have you still got Millicent's nose or something? Hermione let her robes fall and Ron backed into the sink. Her face was covered in black fur. Her eyes had turned yellow and there was long, pointed ears poking through her hair. It was a c cat hair, she howled. The Millicent Bulstrode must have a cat, and the potion isn't supposed to be used for animal transformations. Uh-oh, said Ron. You'll be teased something dreadful, said Myrtle happily. It's okay, Hermione, said Harry quickly. We'll take you up to the hospital wing. Madame Pomfrey never asked too many questions. It took a long time to persuade Hermione to leave the bathroom. Moaning Myrtle sped them on their way with a hearty guffaw. Wait till everyone finds out you've got a tail. And that's where we're going to leave it off for today. So thank you guys so much for joining me for this What a Book. If you liked it, make sure to reach out on social media to let me know, as this is marked safe for kids, and thus you cannot leave any comments on the video. If you feel so inclined, check out everything else that I do using the link tree link down below, which will take you to the other YouTube channel, The Soloist, as well as the Twitch channel, The Soloist 2014, with underscores between those two, those three things, uh, as well as all of my social media, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Uh, I know that TikTok doesn't get used too often. I'm going to try and do more with it. It's just, I really don't like TikTok. <laughs> I really don't like using it, but sometimes you got to. So thank you guys again. I've been Matthew Allen. This has been What a Book, and I will see all of you next week for What a Thought.